Biomarkers and Enrichment for Sepsis Trials by Dr. Hector Wong. Uh, biomarkers for enrichment, uh, these are my disclosures. The work that I'll show you is funded by <clears throat> grants from the NIH. I have a couple of advisory board appointments, neither of which are at all relevant to this talk. Uh, but what is relevant to this talk is that my institution and I hold patents um, for um, some of these stratification biomarkers. So most of us, when we think about biomarkers of sepsis, we think of diagnosis, right? Biomarkers to be able to differentiate between SIRS and sepsis or sterile inflammation and sepsis, as Dr. Peters uh, spoke about earlier. And this is a really, really important topic, as Dr. Peters said, but it's not what we're going to be focusing on. It's not so much about diagnosis, but it's more for this concept of enrichment, okay? And so what does enrichment mean? I think Dr. Peters alluded to this earlier um, but what enrichment means is that you, one uses patient characteristics, any patient characteristic, to select a population in which an intervention, such as ECMO perhaps, is more likely to be detected than an unselected population. All right, and then that's the broad concept. There's some more specific comments. There's a concept of prognostic enrichment in which you select a population that has a higher likelihood of, of having a disease-related event, such as mortality or organ failure. <clears throat> and then there's a concept of predictive enrichment in which you select a population that is more likely to respond to your intervention based on biology or based on a mechanism. So those are the concepts, and we're going to talk about biomarkers to address these concepts. And the way we've approached this is that we've had the good fortune of being able to conduct genome-wide expression studies in many, many children, uh, well over 200, um, <clears throat> from across the country, sort of in a very exploratory approach. And we've used bioinformatics to try to identify enrichment biomarkers. And what I'll talk with you about first are prognostic enrichment uh, biomarkers. And basically, without taking you through all the details, what this means is that we were able to find or identify about 100 genes that seem to have some predictive capacity for mortality. And so these genes are all obviously at the mRNA level, so we wanted to pare this down to something that is perhaps more translatable or more feasible in the clinical setting. So we said, okay, among these 100 genes, what is biologically plausible? And then perhaps even more important pragmatically, among those genes, what can we actually measure in the plasma or serum compartment of their protein? Because we want to try to get to actually a feasible clinical test. And so using those criteria, we came up with this list of 12. Um, uh, it's also published if you're interested. And so using those 12 biomarkers, what we've tried to do is we've tried to develop <clears throat> what we call the pediatric sepsis biomarker risk model, which is PERSEVERE for short. The initial iteration of this involved over 350 kids from about 17, 17 institutions. 11% mortality, and basically what we did is that we measured these 12 candidate stratification biomarkers from the serum compartment. So we're shifting now from mRNA expression to protein expression. Importantly, these biomarkers were, were assayed or measured, or the samples came from samples that were drawn within the first 24 hours of coming into the ICU. And I would argue that that's when you want to be able to make these kinds of predictions. And then the, the modeling approach, we looked at a variety of models. In the end, we settled on this modeling approach called CART, which is an acronym for classification and regression tree. Um, and basically what that allows you to do is to, is to build a decision tree of, with this process of binary recursive partitioning that allows you to provide a mortality probability. And so this is what the tree looks like. It's not as complicated as it looks. It's basically inverted, if you will, that the root is at the top. Okay, and that the root node contains all of the subjects in that initial study with their respective <clears throat> mortalities and survivals. And so what this decision tree does is that it begins to partition patients into different levels of risk based on a biomarker cutoff. So that, that initial cutoff there is based on CCL3, and then it continues to do this. This is that concept of recursive binary partitioning, that it continues to generate daughter nodes into different um, <clears throat> risk categories until it can no longer divide the patients any longer. And so the way to read these trees is to look at the terminal nodes. And terminal has nothing to do with mortality. Terminal means simply that 
they can no longer divide the patient. So in this case, the terminal node that I'm highlighting there, if one has those series of biomarker-based decisions or criteria, you end up in that terminal node, then your mortality probability is very low, 0.011 as opposed to ending up in this terminal node, again, with those sets of biomarker criteria, your mortality probability is about 0.472. And so that's the way to think about these. And so in this particular tree, there are, there are three low-risk terminal nodes within which your mortality probability is very low. There are these uh, intermediate risk terminal nodes, and if you will, for lack of a better term, mortality probability is about 18 to 27%. And then you have these two <clears throat> um, high risk terminal nodes in which your mortality rate is about 50% or greater. All right, and that's the way to think about this. Again, Dr. Peters alluded to this. We all want to want to see biomarkers give us yes, no, right? Dichotomous, and life is just not that simple. Okay. So I, I would urge you to think about biomarkers, as Dr. Peters alluded to, as a probability. Okay, what is the probability of mortality? What is the probability of sepsis? What is the probability of a certain outcome? That's the way I, I believe that we should be thinking about these biomarkers and these models. Nonetheless, you can still generate a two-by-two two contingency table in which you, um, you categorize all the high and intermediate risk patients as predicted non-survivors, know the low risk as predicted survivors. Um, those that, that's in the initial test, this is how this came out. Pretty good um, <clears throat> um, performance characteristics there with an AUC approaching 0.8. And these models require testing and we've I've done multiple um, subsequent validation study and we see very similar performance um, across, across a variety of patients. We're up to well over 700 patients now. And so how does one apply this? So what? So one way is to inform individual uh, patient decision making that perhaps one could save or identify patients that are higher risk and you could allocate those patients to higher risk therapies such as perhaps ECMO or, or some other intervention. This is the same concept of situational awareness. In certain settings, I think this kind of modeling could, uh, could uh, um, assist with allocation of ICU resources uh, where patients go in a given hospital or a certain region. Benchmarking, we've talked quite a bit about improving outcomes in sepsis and so forth. I think models such as this could potentially serve as a benchmark or a denominator. In other words, it can estimate the probability of mortality in your particular population, and that can be your denominator after you <clears throat> introduce some quality improvement efforts. But ultimately, I think where it could be most powerful is for prognostic enrichment of clinical trials, so we'll focus a little bit on that. Um, so. This concept of prognostic enrichment is relatively simple. It just has a fancy name, okay? So when one is thinking about a clinical trial, one of the key decisions is your sample size. And so when you're thinking about the sample size, you're thinking what, what affects that is your effect size of your intervention, but also your event rate, okay? Those are the two main factors that go into calculating a, a, a um, a uh, sample size for your trial. And so what prognostic enrichment does, it selects a population with a greater event rate. That's the concept of prognostic enrichment. And by doing so, you could potentially decrease the sample size of your trial. And so we've not been able to actually do this yet. We hope to, but we haven't been able to do this in a prospective manner. But we've done the next best thing, which is a trial simulation. And what we focused on are kids that have septic shock and TAM off, this concept of thrombocytopenia associated multiple organ failure. So, and so the purported intervention for TAM off is plasma exchange, which is not benign. It's not cannulation through the chest, as Dr. McLaren just spoke about, but nonetheless, it's exposure to an extracorporeal circuit and so forth. And so we use the data from this uh, quasi-trial that's listed on clinicaltrials.gov. And so we looked at our database and we found 108 patients who met the same criteria that are listed for that trial. And so they would be eligible, theoretically, for plasmapheresis. And this group, just based on meeting those criteria, had a mortality rate of 38%. And so to each of those patients, we assigned a persevere mortality risk, and we found 39 true positives, 35 false positives, and you can read the rest. So theoretically, in this trial simulation, again, this is all theory, this is all computers, okay, we would exclude those, these patients that are low risk because they have a very low probability of mortality. And you would include the patients that are higher risk based on that model. 
And so what this does is it selects a population with an overall mortality rate of 53%, remembering that the initial mortality rate was 38%. So that's the concept of increasing your event rate. And so then the trial simulation, really, we just assumed a range of uh, effects of plasmapheresis, mortality reductions ranging from 10 to 50%, standard power and alpha. And those are the number of patients that you were, would require if the patients were not stratified. However, if you selected the patients based on, on the model, you can see that the number of patients for each size effect gets reduced by about 40 or 45 percent. Not a very difficult concept, but this is that concept of prognostic enrichment in which you select the population with a greater event rate, and then you can reduce your effect size. I'm sorry, your sample size. So now let's turn to predictive enrichment. And again, what we've done here through this bioinformatics and transcriptomics if we, is that we've tried to identify um, what we call septic shock endotypes. So what is an endotype? So an endotype is a subclass of a disease or a syndrome as defined by biology or, or some other characteristic. All right. And so if you think about septic shock as a syndrome, that, that hasn't really come up yet in this session, right? We're, we're talking a little bit about it as sort of a singular disease, is it, and it's anything but. It's really a syndrome. It's a constellation of problems, and the patients are very different. So if you think about septic shock in that way as a syndrome, it implies the existence of endotypes. And so we hypothesize in that these endotypes may have distinct gene expression patterns and biological processes that may then in turn lead to distinct clinical phenotypes. And then we asked the, sim the simple question is, can, by doing transcriptomics, whole genome expression profiling, can we identify endotypes of septic shock? All right. And so this isn't looking at gene variants. This is looking at gene expression. Very different. All right, and so I'm not gonna drag you through all the details, but basically in the initial iteration of this, uh, we were able to identify what we thought were uh, endotypes of septic shock based on the expression patterns of over 8,000 genes. And basically what we did there is we just simply using clustering algorithms that were agnostic completely to patient outcomes or, or patient characteristics. It basically just clustered patients together based on similarities or dissimilarity of gene expression. Post hoc we said, okay, so here's a, a few groups of patients that behave similarly from a gene expression standpoint, but that's all well and good, but are they different clinically, right? Because in the end, that's what really matters. And so when we went back and looked, it turned out that what we call endotype A patients have much higher illness severity, their organ failure burden is higher, and their mortality rate is about threefold um, that of the other groups, so 36% versus 11%. So, that's all well and good, 8,000 genes, it's a lot of fun, I can do a lot of cool things on my computer and things like that, but it doesn't help us very much at the bedside. And so we're interested in trying to get this to be a little bit more clinically feasible, trying to get this to the bedside. And so we've approached this now with this goal of developing a clinical test that can meet the time-sensitive demands, right? Because we need to get these kind of data back very, very, very quickly within a couple of hours. So step one is we went from 8,000 genes to 100 genes. 100 genes, measuring 100 genes, starts to get a little bit more clinically feasible for the ICU. And then we're starting to express these, uh, the genes using this, this thing called JEDI, the Gene Expression Dynamics Inspector, which basically what it does is it gives complex array data or gene expression data of face, all right? So there's an example from their website. On your left is normal, on the right is cancer, and without knowing the genes, you can tell they're different. The other step that we've taken is now we're measuring gene expression using a, a multiplex mRNA quantification platform that gives you a digital readout. And this is standard hybridization um, of uh, nucleic acids using both reporter and uh, capture probes. And basically what it allows you to do is generate a count of mRNA expression. The nice thing about this is that you can do it in, um, in solution phase. Um, so it takes away another step. There's no amplification such as PCR. So this is what the pediatric endotypes look like based on 100 genes and that digital platform, okay? So again, without knowing anything about bioinformatics, gene expression studies, and so forth, you can look there. The patients on your right, endotype A, look very different than the endotype B patients. 
And so the endotype A patients tend to be younger, sicker, and have worse outcomes, okay? But this isn't just a fancy CBC because it, th those kids actually have <clears throat> higher lymphocyte counts than the endotype B patients. And so if we do logistic regression that accounts for age, illness severity, comorbidity, and so forth, something about being allocated to endotype A means you're going to have a worse outcome. So those kids have almost a threefold worse outcome. So I haven't told you what the genes are. So what those genes represent are adaptive immunity and the glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway. Okay, adaptive immunity and the glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway, and those genes are repressed in the endotype A patients. That's the blue coloring that you see relative to the red. So if this is true, imagine that this is true, this may have implications or might have implications for precision medicine. <clears throat> the new math now is that we're saying, well, all the old stuff of inhibiting inflammation and so forth hasn't worked. Now we actually have to augment the adaptive immune system biologically plausible, but if this is true, one could imagine that these two classes of patients are gonna have a very different response to any kind of adaptive immune enhancing strategy. Glucocorticoids, okay? I think it's embarrassing that it's 2016 and we still don't have an answer of whether we should be using hydrocortisone or not. So in any case, again, if this is true, one could imagine that these children a versus B would have a different response to hydrocortisone or glucocorticoids because the genes that correspond to the receptor and the whole signaling pathway are differentially expressed. And we were actually able to look this in a post hoc manner. And surprisingly, what it turns out is that the kids that are in endotype A, if they get corticosteroids, they have four times the risk of dying. And that's independent of illness severity, independent of comorbidities and so forth by logistic regression. It's all post hoc though. So we think that because these endotype defining genes correspond to adaptive immunity and the, and the glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway that they may be able to serve or might be able to serve as predictive enrichment biomarkers. And so recently we asked the question is, can we identify kids who may actually benefit from corticosteroids if we combine both prognostic and predictive enrichment. And so we did that. For prognostic enrichment, we classified the kids based on persevere, in which we assigned them a baseline mortality probability. For predictive enrichment, we allocated them to endotype A or an endotype B. Again, remember that the endotype B patients actually have expression of the genes that correspond to this pathway. And I'm not going to take you through all the math, but among endotype B patients, okay, who have an intermediate to high mortality um, risk at baseline, adjunctive corticosteroids actually decrease mortality tenfold. All right, so here, that's the concept. Endotype B, predictive enrichment, right? We, we're selecting the kids that have increased expression, actually are expressing these genes, and we're also selecting the kids that have a higher likelihood of mortality, increasing the event rate that's prognostic enrichment. I caution, though, this is all post hoc. All post hoc analyses have, <clears throat> have lots and lots of problems, but it's the best that we can do right now. But the size effect is hard to argue with, tenfold. So we're trying to look at this now prospectively, um, and hopefully I can have some more data for you at some other point. So the next one of the next step moving forward is, is developing assays now that can generate data quickly. We, we often forget about that when we talk about biomarkers. We need to be able to generate data. And I would argue that the technology to measure genes and to measure proteins quickly is here. It's just a matter of investing the resources and funds and the time and the energy to do it. And so for us, that's the next step, is generating rapid assay platforms <clears throat> that could generate these data um, within one or two hours and then be able to test some of these concepts prospectively through clinical trials. Thank you for listening. These are the contributing centers um, um, that are currently uh, enrolling patients in our database. Um, some of you are in the audience here and we couldn't thank you enough for, um, for that collaboration. Otherwise, this wouldn't be possible. And thank you very much for listening. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.